Greetings. This is the third of uh, my lectures in clear thinking and ambiguity and obscurity. And we're going to focus on questions, ambiguous questions. And so uh, without further ado, I will share my screen. Where is it? Is it? I think so. Share. But now I want to go to slideshow and why is this not working? Oh, here we are. There we are. Okay. So critically thinking about critical thinking about questions, right? We're going to look at a uh, six different uh, topics, nonsense questions, rhetorical questions, complex questions, why questions, and range of answers, what's called contrast classes, and how questions, where we deal with questions of manner, method, and means, and then finally we'll look at surveys and ambiguous questions. So we'll start off with nonsense questions. Today we see a distinct separation between questions of modern science and questions of modern philosophy. Both inquiries are similar in that they use rational methods, but they differ in terms of the kinds of questions each seeks to answer. So I maintain that scientific questions uh, are not proper to philosophy and ph philosophical questions are not proper to science, that there's a qualitative difference between those uh, questions. And this is something uh, that I cover when I'm teaching my intro to philosophy class, or even if I'm teaching an upper division class, I like to point out that I'm trying to locate philosophy and sort of see it. Uh, how does it stand in relation to things like science and religion and uh, history and other sorts of uh, uh, forms of inquiry. So I maintain that they are differ, uh, philosophy and science, because they ask and answer different kinds of questions. What is the nature of that difference? Well, I maintain that science seeks to answer questions which are empirical in nature. Empirical is just a fancy word for observational. So notice if you can answer a question simply by doing an empirical observation, well, that's redundant, an empirical investigation, uh, then it is not a philosophical question. It's a scientific question. And I'm conceiving of science very broadly so as to include uh, the social sciences, history, et cetera. I think history is a kind of empirical discipline. Uh, economics, political science are empirical disciplines. Frankly, advertising is an empirical discipline. And you would, uh, uh, you know, uh, questions about uh, what motivates people to purchase, make various purchases and that sort of thing. So um, if a question can be answered by an empirical investigation, then I think it belongs to one of the sciences. Again, empirical is a word which simply means observational. It refers to what can be known through sensory experience. So if you can settle a question by counting or weighing or putting two chemicals together in a test tube and seeing what color they uh, they uh, turn or taking a poll or something like that, well, then this is an empirical investigation and an empirical question, and it belongs to one of the branches of science. But what about questions which cannot be answered by empirical investigation? Questions that no amount of science could hope to answer. Are all non-empirical questions necessarily philosophical? Well, in a word, no. There are certain questions which science cannot answer, but they don't belong to philosophy either. Why? Well, because they are simply nonsense questions. So there are certain questions which science can't answer because they're nonsense. No amount of empirical investigation can answer them because there's something conceptually wrong with the question itself. An example, how high is up? Well, notice how high is up is not some grand philosophical question. It's a badly formed question. And when I say badly formed, I don't mean it's grammatically badly formed. It violates uh, none of the rules of English grammar to ask that question. It is a legitimate sentence in the English language, but there's something conceptually flawed about that question. Likewise, if I were to ask, what is the color of love? Oh my, that was a song years ago. What is the color of love, right? But notice, Seriously speaking, that's a nonsense question. There is no way to answer that, whether it be through science or philosophy or any other form of inquiry. Or what is east of the moon? 
Again, there's something conceptually flawed with that very question. Now to ask what is east of the DM building or to ask oh, what is east of Los Angeles or to ask uh, what is east of Japan? Well, all of those questions make perfectly good sense. But what is east of the moon? No, there's something conceptually wrong with that. Again, nothing grammatically wrong, but something conceptually wrong. No, these are indeed properly formed questions in the English language. They commit no grammatical mistakes in terms of being interrogative sentences. And no further that they are not empirical questions. No amount of empirical investigation could hope to answer them. So they are questions and they are not empirical. However, the only person who would seriously ask such a question and hope for an answer is someone who literally doesn't know what he or she was talking about. Right. So my four year old grand nephew might ask something like how high is up. Right. It used to be I would say my four year old nephew. Now my nephew has a four year old himself. So uh, so now my four year old grand nephew might ask that question. Fortunately, his father doesn't ask that question anymore. But my when it, when he was four, he might have. However, in these cases, at least, it's easy to see that these are nonsense questions because all answers to these questions are equally silly, equally ridiculous. So imagine that um, I'm babysitting my grandnephew and he's asking me questions and he asks, you know, how high is up? Well, if I'm the good grand uncle, I would sit him down and I say, oh, listen, Caleb, no, you don't understand. Up is not something that has a height. You can't ask how high up is. Up is a sort of direction, right? but it's not a height. It's not a thing with a, a particular height to it. right?" And I would try to explain to him as best I could why the question is simply misconceived. But if he's been after me all day long and asking questions, asking questions, asking questions, it's time for bed, maybe I'm not going to be the good grand nephew, I mean, grand uncle, I'm going to go, okay, you know what, six feet, six feet is up, five feet, 11 inches, you still aren't up, you get to six feet, you're up now, okay, we're done, go to bed. Well, of course, that wouldn't be a very kind thing to do, although, you know, I might be tempted from time to time. Why? Well, because the six feet isn't up, that's not, all answers make no sense of it. I could say a mile, it wouldn't make any sense either. Right. So no height is going to satisfy that uh, question. And that's what I mean by saying all answers to such a question are equally ridiculous. Again, what is the color of love? And I always say, oh, mauve. Mauve is the color of love. It used to be chartreuse, but last year they changed it. Now it's mauve. Well, you see, that's ridiculous. Right. All answers are equally silly. These non-empirical questions can be labeled category mistakes. And I think that that is one of the things that goes on to make these, to render these nonsense questions. Each of one involves a category mistake. One is asking, for instance, to know the height of something that doesn't belong to the category of things with a height, or to know the color of something that doesn't belong to the category of colored things. So the questions themselves presuppose and presume category membership that does not in fact obtain. So that's why they're conceptually flawed. The question itself is making a presupposition which isn't justified. You're presuming that up belongs to the category of things with height when it doesn't. Lots of things do to say how high is the Eiffel Tower, how high is Mount McKinley, uh, how high is the Empire State Building, all of that makes perfectly good sense because those objects do belong to the category of things with a height. Up does not, right? Or to ask what is the color of a fire engine or stop sign or an apple, those things do belong to the category of things with color. Love does not. And so there are category mistakes. Now, some philosophers would claim that many, most, or perhaps even all, of the questions which cannot be answered by science are in fact literally nonsense questions. And so they would say there is no non-empirical question which fails to be a nonsense question. They're all making category mistakes. Take the example of what is the meaning of life? Well, these individuals would say that's not some deep philosophical question. What's the meaning of life? No, they'd say, 
that question falsely presumes that life belongs to the category of things with a meaning. And that uh, 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 the question itself is a category of mistake is conceptually flawed. Stop asking it. In other words, they're trying to be the good uncle and they're trying to explain to us why we shouldn't really try to answer that question, right? They're not gonna give us a silly pat answer and send us to bed. They're gonna go, no, honey, you don't understand. That is a nonsense question, right? And so their job then, at least these philosopher types would say this, their job is to be a kind of therapy, right? Um, who was it? Uh, Gilbert Ryle says, it's the role of philosophy to show the fly the way out of the bottle. Right? Why you've, you've been trying to answer questions which themselves are conceptually flawed. And if you're a little more clear about it, you'd realize it's a nonsense question. Some have argued, as I say, that far from being a deep and important question, the uh, question itself is a nonsense question. It too is a category of mistake. Life, they argue, does not belong to the category of things with a meaning. Words belong to the category of things with a meaning. Signs do, symbols do, but life does not. The view that most philosophy questions or non-empirical questions in general are simply nonsense questions and involve category mistakes gained wide acceptance even among philosophers in the first part of the 20th century. And some philosophers hold this view even today. There are certain scientists who hold this view uh, today. I think if poked and prodded, perhaps Neil deGrasse Tyson would say something like that, that these philosophical questions don't amount to anything. The proper response to such questions is not to try to answer them, but rather like the good grand uncle to explain why these questions are simply nonsense. Now, I am not one of these philosophers. I don't share this view. And I think that there are meaningful non-empirical questions and that they form the substance of philosophical inquiry. That's not what this course is about, but if you want to take my intro to philosophy course, I'd be happy to uh, tell you more about that. So my view that there are non-empirical questions which nevertheless are re reasonable, meaningful questions, uh, that's the more traditional view. Traditionally, philosophy seeks to answer non-empirical questions which are taken to be both meaningful and important, and which can and do admit of answers, some of which are better or more reasonable than others. An example might be something like this, is there a God? Now, first of all, I take that to be a non-empirical question. I don't think any amount of science is going to settle that issue one way or the other. Why? Well, because God is not the sort of thing that necessarily would leave um, empirical evidence of an empirical existence. Many people contend that God is immaterial. Well, if there is an immaterial being, that immaterial being is not going to leave physical evidence of a physical existence since it doesn't have one. Right? So it doesn't seem like uh, science can settle that, uh, either confirm or disconfirm the existence of God. Note that unlike obviously nonsense questions, however, for which all answers are equally ridiculous, the problem here seems to be quite different. The problem here is this is a non-empirical question for which there are at least two perfectly meaningful answers, yes and no. So to the question, is there a God? One might say, yes. The answer to that question is yes, there is a God. Okay, I know what you mean. It's not like that's a crazy answer the color of love is mauve. No, that's a meaningful answer. I don't know if I believe you. I'd like to know what reasons you have for making that claim, but it's a reasonable answer. Or to the question, is there a God? You might respond, no, there is no God. Okay, that's a meaningful answer. I don't know if I believe you. I'd like to know what reasons you have for making that claim, but it's not nonsense. Right? So here it's not like no answer makes any sense. The problem is we have two competing answers, each of which makes sense to some extent. What remains to be seen is which, if either, of these perfectly sensible possible answers is true, or at least which of these answers could garner greater rational support if either one. Right? So that's what I take to be the substance of philosophy. But for our purposes, it's just enough to know that just because a sentence is grammatically an interrogative sentence 
doesn't necessarily mean it's a meaningful sentence. And we wanna be on guard for sentences which presuppose category membership, which doesn't actually occur. And these form nonsense questions. Now we're on to the next. The next are rhetorical questions. A rhetorical question is a device used to persuade or subtly influence an audience. So the purpose of a rhetorical question is a rhetorical effect. It's a question asked not for an answer, but for an effect. Oftentimes a rhetorical question can be used to emphasize a point or just to get the audience thinking. Right? So I might say, oh, it is too hot today, isn't it? Well, I'm not really expecting you to answer me, right? I'm really making a point, it's too hot today. And I'm trying to emphasize that. And I maybe am using the interrogative question, but to achieve a rhetorical effect. Likewise, I say, are you stupid? I'm not expecting you to answer, right? I'm trying to make a point. I'm trying to, uh, again, um, go for an effect. Notice while these are technically questions in the sense that they are interrogatives, right? According to the grammar, uh, but they are not genuine questions in the sense that an answer is not expected. These rhetorical questions are asked to emphasize a point. Is the Pope Catholic? Is rain wet? You didn't think I would say yes to that, did you? Do you want to be a failure for the rest of your life? Does a bear poop in the woods? Can fish swim? Can birds fly? Do bo dogs bark, right? So I'm asking these questions in order to make some sort of emphasis or point. Writers employ rhetorical questions for rhetorical effects, and we cannot easily quantify the impact rendered by a rhetorical question. These are often employed, for instance, in poetry or poetic prose for literary effects. Juliet says, "'Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Thou art thyself, though not a Montague. What's a Montague? It is nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. Oh, be some other name. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. It's not my best Juliet impression, but, uh, but notice when she asks what is in a name, she's not literally asking for an answer. She's trying to achieve a literary rhetorical effect. Get you thinking, right? If winter comes, can spring be far behind? Ode to the West Wind by uh, Shelley, right? <coughs> I like Shelley. Right? Good rhetorical questions can make hearers or readers realize something that they weren't previously aware of. Oh, you're right, you know, what is in a name? Or, you're right, we're in a difficult time right now, but perhaps spring is right around the corner. They can make them think or perhaps gain some insight. This alone will intrigue them enough, perhaps to keep reading the play or watching the play. But this only works if the rhetorical question is sharp and well-crafted. But more for the critical thinker, we wanna look at rhetorical questions when they're used as disguised claims. So what interests us most here is when we use um, a rhetorical question to disguise an assertion. Recall the old debater's motto, one who asserts must prove. Well, the idea here generally is that the burden of proof remains with the affirmative team, the person doing the asserting. If they are asserting P, they are expected to prove P. And this is true in normal conversations and exchanges where one individual is trying to persuade another. The burden of proof rests with the individual making the affirmative assertion. One who, who asserts must prove. So again, the person asserting is expected to support that assertion. But one can sometimes use a rhetorical question as a way of disguising a claim in such a way that it does not immediately seem to need support or evidence. In fact, rhetorical questions can be crafted in such a way as to make the hearer believe they came to the conclusion themselves. And therefore, they don't need you to prove it because they concluded it themselves. Therefore, they can be powerful rhetorical device to persuade someone without providing reason to being persuaded. Oh, 
persuaded rather. Let's try that again. Therefore, they can be a powerful rhetorical device used to persuade someone without actually providing reason to be persuaded. For instance, people don't like to be told what to do. Let's say that you want Randy to stop swearing in front of the children. So you tell him to stop. You say, Randy, please stop swearing in front of the children. And Randy responds, it's a free effing country. <laughs> However, what if in fact you said to him this, Randy, do you really think swearing in front of the children is the best thing to be doing? You're just asking a question. So rather than simply asserting one's point, one leads the hearer to it. It feels more like a conversation and less like a lecture. After all, you're asking Randy his opinion, sort of. Right? Indeed, one may even convince the hearer that they've come to that conclusion on their own. And Randy might go, you know, it isn't a good idea to swear in front of the children. Perhaps I should stop. Now, you had, had you merely boldly declared swearing in front of the children is not the best thing to do, uh, you may not be nearly as convincing. In fact, you may invite challenge. How do you know, Randy might respond. Apparently, Randy's not a nice fellow at all. In both cases, you really are making a claim. But when you disguise it as a rhetorical question, you may be able to slip the claim by without being subject to critical review. Consider the following rhetorical questions. Why would anyone buy anything else? Have you ever met a more disgusting man? Who in their right mind could support that crazy proposal? Does anyone really believe that America isn't a racist country? What could be better evidence of the failure of social models, uh, socialist models of economic distribution than Venezuela? Well, these are all questions but hopefully you see that they're all actually disguised claims. The first one is I'm claiming there is no reason to buy anything else. Well, that's a rather bold claim. How do I know that? Or the, he is a, not only are you claiming in the second one that he's a disgusting man, but he's a disgusting man and you'd be hard pressed to find one more disgusting. Well, again, that's a claim, but it doesn't look like a claim because it's got a question mark at the end. Right? Who in their right mind could support that proposal? Again, the presumption is that that proposal is so crazy, no one in their right mind would support it. But that is a claim, likewise with the others. Agreement to the presumed answer to the rhetorical question is assented to by the hearer, often because it's presented as required by common sense. Right? So who in their right mind could support that proposal? Well, the, 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 the subtext there is I seem to be suggesting common sense would lead anyone to reject that proposal. It is thought that a vast consensus exists as to what the right answer is within the universal audience. And this is related uh, to a mind adherence technique. Hang on one second. Nope. Oh, drat. Darn, hold on. Let this out later. I apologize, I was uh, interrupted there for a moment, but um, I'm gonna go back and clean that up in a bit. But <laughs> we're talking about the fact that the question presents the matter as if there's this already broad consensus. And so common sense would have you agree that, uh, with the um, presumed answer to that rhetorical question, right? Um, but of course, this may or may not be true. There may in fact be no such broad consensus and the claim disguised as a question may well be controversial and in need of defense. This is why the critical thinker must be on guard when confronted with rhetorical questions, particularly rhetorical questions uh, which are in fact disguised claims. Why isn't this working? There we go. 
complex questions. Now, number three, a complex question is a fallacy in which the answer to a given question presupposes uh, a prior answer to a prior question. Uh, this is also referred to as a loaded question, a trick question, a leading question, the fallacy of false questions, the fallacy of many questions, has goes by a bunch of names. Um, the classic example of a complex question would be, have you stopped beating your wife? Notice it presumes a yes or no answer, but if you say yes, well, then, ah, so you used to beat your wife. Or if you say no, you're, ah, so you're still beating your wife, right? So there's no way out of that question. The question itself presumes that at one time you did beat your wife, but uh, it presumes it without evidencing it without uh, and without even asking it, right? So it'd be one thing if I said, have you beaten your wife in the past? And you're, well, yes. Well, have you stopped beating your wife? Okay, well, then that wouldn't be a, a complex question, but the question as a standalone question is complex. Let's talk about Glauken. You might say, where did you get the poison you used on him? Well, of course, it presumes that you got poison and used it on him. Uh, he was woken two hours later, and presently a doctor examined him. What drugs were you on? The doctor asks. Wilt stared at him bl blindly. I've never taken any drugs in my life, he muttered. Well, of course, what drugs are you on is a complex question. Plurium interrogator, uh, ta, ah, inter, inter, gationum. I don't know. I'm not good at Latin. In any case, that's just the Latin, which translates many questions, or again, the fallacy of the complex question. When several questions are combined into one in such a way that a yes, no answer is required, and the person they are asked has no chance to give separate replies, and again, that's the fallacy of the complex question. Again, we've already said, have you stopped beating your wife? Did the pollution you cause increase or decrease your profits? Did, you, uh, did your misleading claims result in your getting promoted? Uh, is your stupidity inborn? Are you still a heavy drinker? Did John ever give up his bad habits? You know, these are all complex questions. All of them contain an assumption that the concealed question has already been asked and answered affirmatively. It is this unjustified presumption which constitutes the fallacy. Each of these questions, uh, there lies an assumed answer to a previous unasked question. Again, did John have any bad habits? Is the unasked question whose answer is assumed in the question, did John ever give up? his bad habits. We need to withhold any answer to the complex question until this prior question has been resolved. In some instances of this fallacy, considerable struggle may be necessary in order to liberate ourselves from the misleading influence of the complex question. The complex question has to be broken into simpler ones, and often the de denial of the fact presumed invalidates the larger question. The fallacy of complex questions is the interrogative form of the fallacy of begging the question. Like the latter, it begs the question by assuming the conclusion at issue. So remember, for the context of this course, I'm using the classical notion of what the sentence or the phrase begging the question means, right? I know that in common parlance, people use the phrase begging the question to mean something else. Uh, they might say, well, you know, um, Congress appropriated a lot of uh, uh, sweeping new environmental regulations, but that begs the question, who's going to pay for it? Well, that's how the word begs the question is used. It's used by broadcasters and, and, and authors and that sort of stuff. That's how it's used today. The older classical meaning of begging the question is a fallacy where you begin by assuming what you're trying to prove. And I mentioned this in an earlier lecture, perhaps you'll recall. So if I said, <clears throat> well, um, in vitro fertilization is immoral because it's wrong. Well, all I've said is it's immoral because it's immoral. That's begging the question. I'm not giving you additional reasons to conclude that it is immoral. So that's what begging the question classically means, assuming what you're trying to prove. Well, this is the interrogative form of begging the question because the complex question is assuming something 
without proving it. And it's concluding it at the end. Ah, so you've been beating your wife without actually proving it. The fallacy of the complex question is the interrogative form of the fallacy of begging the question. Like the latter, it begs the question by assuming the conclusion at issue. I'm just repeating myself now. Although not an argument as such, a complex question involves an implicit argument. This argument is usually intended to trap the respondent into acknowledging something that he or she might otherwise not want to acknowledge. The serious consequences of complex questions can be appreciated by considering these trick questions, which would be out of order in a court of law. So if, uh, if the prosecution is asking the defendant a complex question, hopefully the defense uh, attorney will object. That's a leading question. That's a complex question. Wait a minute, right? Before the, the defendant actually responds, right? Again, what did you use to wipe your fingerprints off the gun? Well, I you know, hopefully your defense attorney jumps in there before you incriminate yourself. Or how long had you contemplated this robbery before you carried it out? Number four now, why contrast questions and range of uh, answers? That should probably be why questions and then we're talking about contrast and range of answers. I think I have a, a typo here. But when I say why questions, I mean questions that begin with the word why. Why questions, questions which you begin by asking why. So there's two types of contrast in an explan explanando, uh, that thing to be explained. Now, uh, it is now commonly accepted that most or all explanations involve contrasts. These contrasts appear in the form of a rather than clause in the explanatory request, sometimes explicitly, but often implicitly. What do I have in mind here? Well, Bas von Frossen, the contemporary philosopher, um, gives us, I think, a very nice example. Why did Adam eat the apple, right? Now, notice at first, this seems to be a single straightforward question. Why did Adam eat the apple? But von Frossen notes that this explanatory request remains ambiguous until we make explicit the intended contrast class. For instance, the questioner might have meant any of the following questions. So here's the original question, why did Adam eat the apple? But what does that question mean? What is, the, what is being requested? So why did Adam eat the apple rather than someone else? like Sam or Mary or Satan? Or why did Adam eat the apple rather than doing something else with it, like baking it into a pie or planting it? Or why did Adam eat the apple rather than some of the other fruit available to him, like a papaya? So the original question, why did Adam eat the apple, is actually an ambiguous question until you fill in the contrast classes. Now, sometimes this is done explicitly. In this case, they are, right? I'm quite explicit. Why did Adam, rather than someone else, eat the apple, right? So there, the contrast is explicit. Sometimes it might be implicit. In other words, in our conversations, and I said, why did Adam eat the apple? Right? Um, rather than obey God, we might say. And that's really what I'm asking. Why did he eat the apple rather than obey God's command? So that's, in that case, there's the contrast. Maybe if we're having a conversation about, I don't know, uh, Christian theology and original sin or something like that, maybe that would be clear from the context of the conversation, or it might be made more explicit by the person saying rather than, right? But whether it's explicit or implicit, the why questions always presume a range of answers. And you have to distinguish from that range of answers, which, rather than phrase, which rather than clause is intended. What counts as a satisfactory answer to the initial question depends on which of the more explicit questions is meant. So if the answer was because Adam was hungry, well, that may be a good answer to the second of the questions we looked at, but not to the first and not to the third. This feature of contrast questions is key to understanding explanation and more specifically, what sort of explanation is being sought or would be found satisfactory. Incidentally, this is the mechanism that works on all kinds of jokes, like why did the chicken cross the road? 
to get to the other side. Right? Or uh, why do firemen wear red suspenders? Well, to keep their pants from falling down. Right? So notice if the when you hear why do the firemen why uh, do firemen wear red suspenders? And you imagine the, the contrast to be why do the firemen wear red suspenders rather than some other color of suspenders? That might be how you understand the question. Why do the why does the uh, do firemen wear red suspenders? But notice the answer to the joke. Why do firemen wear red suspenders? You say, well, to keep their pants from falling down. But that's why do they wear suspenders regardless of the color, right? So anyway, maybe that's not the funniest joke you ever heard, but hopefully that'll help understand a little bit about range of uh, answers to why questions. Technically, we can say with von Frossen that the explan explanandum consists of a fact embedded in a contrast class. That is contrasting what actually happened to what could have happened, a set of alternative possibilities that did not come true. We call these alternative possibilities foils of the fact. Very roughly, giving an explanation is showing what picked out the actual fact, what actually occurred, among all the possible ways things could have gone. It may be thought that not all explananda have the contrast form, however, so maybe they don't all have, but, but many do. So understanding the question means understanding the contrast class, which of the possible contrasts is being asked for, and then providing what picked out the actual occurrence from alternative possibilities. Again, why did Adam eat the apple rather than the papaya or rather than the strawberry or rather than the banana? Unambiguous contrast questions have explicit contrast classes of alternatives to the fact being explained. Again, why did Adam eat the apple rather than any of the other fruits that were available? Now I've, ex I've been explicit as the contrast I'm looking for. This is often supplied by context within which the question is being asked. An ambiguous contrast question provides no such contrast. It is often easier to answer an unambiguous, uh, it is often easier to answer an unambiguous contrast question than to explain an ambiguous one. I don't know what that means that. I'm gonna go on to the next slide. I might have that backwards. For instance, why did Adam eat the apple rather than other fruits? Well, this is the unambiguous one, and that's easier to answer. Because on this occasion, Eve, because on this occasion, Eve offered him an apple rather than some other fruit, say a papaya. So if one knows that Joe has a preference for Marvel film movies, uh over let's say period pieces, that fact can explain why did Joe rent Thor rather than Dangerous Liaisons? It was a period piece from many years ago starring Glenn Close. It was actually a good movie. But that fact alone does not explain why he rented Thor uncontrasted with alternatives. In other words, why did he rent Thor at all? Why did he rent any movie at all? Right? So uncontrasted, why did Joe rent that movie left uncontrasted would be harder to answer than why did he rent Thor rather than Dangerous Liaisons? That's a little bit easier to answer, particularly if you know he, he likes uh, the Marvel uh, Cinematic uh, Universe or whatever they call that. Hmm? While it is often easier to answer an unambiguous contrast questions than to explain an ambiguous one, it's not always the case. Yet sometimes it, uh, it can be the other way around. Why is that? Well, you can explain why Jones contacted the flu without explaining or being able to explain why Jones contracted the flu rather than Smith. That might be more difficult. Well, why did he get it rather than him? That might be more difficult than to say, why did Jones get it at all? So in this case, the unambiguous, I'm sorry, the ambiguous, the ambiguous one, which doesn't specify a contrast class, doesn't give you that rather than clause. That's actually easier to answer than the uh, more detailed one. Why did that person in the office get it as opposed to this person? Right. Notice this is a question many of us are asking, why one person in the family came down with COVID as opposed to some other member in the family. When asking the questions, what explains the fatal car uh, accident last night? 
or what did the fatal accident, why did the fatal accident occur last night? <laughs> we have to see these as, in this case, ambiguous. What's the contrast class? Why was it fatal or rather than not fatal? Or why was there an accident rather than no accident? Or why did it occur last night rather than this morning or rather than, right? So the rather thens have been left out. So before answering this question, we might need to get, if the context doesn't provide it, we might, might need to get further clarification on what is the contrast class? What is the rather thens that they're trying to sort out? In other words, it happened last night, this accident, this fatal accident. That's the what actually occurred. What possible uh, non-occurrence thing are they trying to distinguish that from? Until I establish what the contrast is, um, the fact and its attending foils, I do not know what is being asked. A car crash always involves the convergence of numerous factors. For example, it may have involved faulty brakes or insufficient roadway grading or inadequate signage or alcohol consumption. And so any number of these things might have contributed to the accident. Right? Um, and so which of these facts is relevant to your explanation why did the accident occur, depends again on uh, what is being sought. Any and all of these factors may have contributed to the crash and to varying degrees. The extent to which any one of these may be called the cause of the accident will require different sorts of causal explanations and causal chains and conceptual resources. I mean, notice there's a sense in which uh, the law of gravity or uh, the, the, you know, Newton's laws of motion might be called upon to explain why, what was the cause of the accident, right? Uh, breaks and chains of physical factors, alcohol and biological and perceptual factors might all factor in. You might have to talk about the effect of alcohol on the central nervous system and uh, the diminishment of perceptual and uh, motor abilities, etc. One way of giving content to the idea that there are different kinds of causes and causal relations is to view causal relations as explanatory ones and to view explanations as answers to certain kinds of why questions. Aristotle defended an account of causation and explanation along these lines. A cause, he said, was an answer to the question of why or on what account. Uh, von Frossen is making a similar claim here. An explanation, he says, is an answer to a why question. Aristotle actually distinguishes four distinct kinds of answers to why questions. The ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle delineates four causes or four explanations to answer the question why. They are material, formal, efficient, and final. Aristotle wrote that we do not have knowledge of a thing until we grasp its why, that is to say its cause, or in this case, its causes. Um, oh, I forget the university all of a sudden. Oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. But there's a university in England, uh, uh, the motto of which is happy is he who knows the causes of things. And that, uh, that motto has in mind the Aristotelian notion of causes. But Aristotle noticed, Aristotle is expanding his notion of cause brought more broadly than we do in English. For him, he's basically saying the four explainers of a thing, right? So happy is he who knows the explainers of things, the causes of things. The Greek word for cause that Aristotle uses refers to a causal explanation and is translated cause. But again, he's using it more broadly than we normally use the word cause in English. Our contemporary understanding of cause most nearly approximates Aristotle's notion of efficient cause. But Aristotle's cause is probably nearer in our language to this notion of explanation or explainer or explaining factor, we might say. So consider a wooden mantle clock, right? So it's a, it's a mantle clock and it's made largely out of wood. Right? I might ask, why does it float when thrown into the pond? Or I might ask, why does it have its numerals one through 12 distributed in radial symmetric pattern on its dial? Or I may ask, why does it exist here in my house on this shelf right now? 
Or I might ask, why does it chime each hour on the hour? So those are all why questions, but notice what explains those, the cause of each of these facts um, is different and importantly different. In the first case, this is explained because of what it's made of, its material cause. Why does it float? Because it's made of wood. The second one, why does it have the numerals in a radial sym uh, symmetric pattern? Well, because it's an analog clock and this is the nature, this is the form, this is the, uh, the nature of, the, uh, of this species of clocks, right? Analog clocks are, uh, have a typical form of uh, a radial uh, symmetry of, of numerals. Why does it exist here in my house? Well, because it was manufactured in New York City, it was purchased by me in a store, it was carried home by me and I placed it on the shelf, right? So I am the efficient cause, well, first the store was the efficient cause of its coming to be, and I was the efficient cause of what brought it home and put it on the shelf, right? So this accounts for why it moves in certain directions and has a certain kind of existence. It's efficient cause, what brought it about. Again, this is the closest to our notion of cause. If I asked what caused the fire, I'm probably asking is what brought about the fire? It's not the only kind of why question to ask, right? But then the, the number four, why does it chime every hour on the hour? Well, because of its purpose or its function or its goal, its final cause, it's supposed to tell time. So this is the, uh, the Greek word for the end or the purpose of something is it's telos. And Aristotle thought that many things have purposes or functions. He had a teleological worldview. And you can explain the behavior of things by appealing to what their purpose or their function or their goal is. Uh, the purpose or function of the heart, for instance, is to circulate blood. And this is important knowledge, right? Uh, important knowledge to have. Why do we have hearts to circulate our blood? Now, one thing that hearts do is circulate blood. Another thing hearts do is go ba-bump, ba-bump, ba-bump. But it's not their purpose or function to go ba-bump, ba-bump, ba-bump. And if they didn't go ba-bump, 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 they could probably still be very efficient hearts. I don't know, but I suspect. But how important the ba-bumping is, the purpose of a heart is to circulate blood. And that's really important if you want to know the, when uh, a heart is malfunctioning, you have to know what its function is in order to know when it's malfunctioning. So material cause, formal cause, efficient cause, final cause. I won't rehearse that here because we've already done that now. Again, the Greek word that Aristotle is using had previously been used in legal contexts, uh, referring to what or who is responsible. Uh, this is mostly, but not always, a bad sense of who's guilty or who's to blame. But alternatively, it means, and who should we credit? Who's responsible for this good thing or this beautiful work of art or whatnot, right? The appropriation of this same word by Aristotle and other philosophers reflect how the Greek experience of legal practice influenced the concern in Greek thought to determine what is responsible for things. Now on to number five, how questions, manner, method, and means. So we've been discussing why questions. Now I wanna talk briefly about how questions. Aristotle defended an account of causation and explanation along these lines. The cause, he said, was an answer to the question of why. We've already said that. And von Frossen makes a similar claim. But others have suggested that this is not just with regard to why questions, but also how questions, since many how questions are requests for explanations as well. And they point out to a similar kind of ambiguity that can occur with how questions. So we were looking at ambiguities that arise from why questions. Now we're gonna look at ambiguities that arise from how questions. And these ambiguities arise over differences between manner, method, and means. Examining the uh, proposed logic of why and how questions can expose the range of explanatory factors and relations being sought. Sometimes these presumptions exclude equally good and potentially preferable explanatory accounts. 
So again, the problem with the ambiguity is you don't know what is being asked. And if you don't know what's being asked, you don't know how to respond and what constitutes a good and satisfying response and what does not constitute a good and satisfying response. So you have to get clarity on the question in order to, um, in order to effectively answer the question. So notice to the question, how did Judith kill Holofernes? Fernes? Holofernes. Polo Furnes, I think it is. Anyway, it's a biblical story and I don't quite know how to pronounce the name. Judith, I don't have a problem with, but. Um, so how did she kill him? Right? Well, this too is an ambiguous question. It's a question about manner or is it a question about means or is it a question about method? Right? Manners, methods, and means are among the things we ask about when we ask how questions. So how did Judith kill him? Well, I might say with a mixture of revulsion and determination, or I might say with a mixture of bile and snake venom, or I might say with a mixture of seduction and cunning. Okay. But while all of these might be true, they all are answers to different questions. So the, the question was simply, how did Judith kill Holofernes? Right. But what does that mean? What's being asked? Am I asking what was her manner? of clean, uh, killing him. In that case, answer A would be appropriate. Or if I'm asking what technique did she use? Well, answer B would be appropriate. Or if I'm asking how did she manage to exercise or execute this technique? Uh, I might answer with C, but this is a question of, uh, I'm sorry, manner, method, and means, right? Again, the first answer supplies the manner, the second answer supplies the method, and the third answer supplies the means. What is meant by manner? Manner is a stylized way of doing something, right? Uh, uh, you might say, well, he always sings in that manner, in that kind of stylized way. Manner is a, an adverbial um, kind of description of a thing. So the very same task, the very same method, could have been conducted in some different manner. For instance, I might say he sang Proud Mary, you know, the song Proud Mary, but he sang Proud Mary bel canto, right, which is a certain style of singing, sort of an odd way to sing Proud Mary, but you could. But he could have sung that same song, in other words, performed the same task, achieved that same method in a modern rock style, right? Like clear it's uh, Clearwater Revival does, or like Tina Turner does, right? Neither one of those sing it or perform it in a bel canto style or manner. So if I'm asking how was or how does, uh, I might be asking a question of manner. Manner can also refer to social behavior, as in the sentence, it's bad manners to speak loudly. Sometimes a word manner suggests a kind of polite or well-bred behavior, like that fellow has good manners or that fellow has no manners whatsoever. In this sentence, you uh, can find the word manner refers to a polite behavior, which a man is expected to conduct himself or irrespective of the tasks he might be performing. So again, manner seems to be a separate question from method. Method refers to a specific procedure that is followed, certain notes in a certain order to accomplish the task. Again, um, the, the, the poison chosen by Judith to kill her, um, to kill uh, Polophonis, right? The word method can have its nearest equivalent, perhaps in the word procedure. Right? So how did she kill him? Might be a question of what procedure did she employ to, to kill him? On the other hand, the word manner um, can have its nearest equivalent in way, right? What is the style or the, uh, the uh, uh, mannerisms, right? Now means is very similar to method, but it often suggests a sort of setting the table, right? So how did Judith manage to get him to take the poison? Well, with her seduction and her cunning, right? So she sort of uh, achieves the method by a certain means. Or I might say, how did he win the election? And you might answer, oh, by getting more votes than his opponent. Well, that's the method. But how did that happen, right? Well, you might say by ingratiating himself to his constituents. This was the means he employed 
to execute his method, right? So how did he win the election? Again, you might mean something like that. Again, well, let me be more clear. How did he win the election is an ambiguous question until you know whether this is a question about manner, method, or means. Likewise, you don't know what a satisfying response to the question is until you eliminate that ambiguity. So consider, how do porcupines make love? So very carefully. Or how did our football team win the game by scoring more points than the other team? Or uh, how was your dinner? Oh, delivered by Uber Eats. Right? Well, again, there seems to be a slippage between the question that is intended and the question that's being answered in each of these cases. So now on to our final look at questions. And this is looking at surveys and ambiguous questions that appear in surveys. So of course, surveys can be very helpful in giving us all kinds of information about how individuals feel about things, what their attitudes are, what their intentions are, maybe how they'll behave in the future. So surveys can be very valuable in gaining data. But in order to collect the data, the data must, I mean, in order for the data to be helpful rather, it has to be valid and it must actually know what we're measuring or we're intending to measure. But there are numerous ways that you can corrupt a survey so that it actually doesn't provide you with any useful data, or at least minimally useful data. Perhaps the single biggest mistake is ambiguous wording of survey questions. This happens when the meaning of key words or phrases is unclear. People could have different interpretations as to what question is being asked. If the respondents understand the questions differently, they are answering different questions despite the fact that the questions are expressed using exactly the same language. But notice if the same question can be interpreted in more than one way, then you don't know who's answering which of the questions that they think are being asked. Again, this happens, uh, when this happens, we cannot interpret the resulting data in any reliable way because we don't know what our respondents are responding to. Consider a survey question asked after the 2016 presidential election regarding Russian meddling. And so here's our, our, our survey question. Do you think Russia interfered in the 2016 election? Now, the question might be posed as a binary yes, no question, or maybe uh, with intervals of degrees or something like that, but let's take it as a yes, no, right? At first, this may appear to be a perfectly fine, straightforward question, right? But take another look at it. There are at least four words in the phrasing of that question that sets up ambiguities. The question contains four words that form how you interpret what the question is and what your answer might be as a result. Think, Russia, interfered, elections. Those are the four troublesome words, I believe. For instance, think, do you think Russia interfered in the 2016 presidential elections? Well, various respondents might require different levels of proof to assert that they think or believe something really happened. So imagine how differently someone might respond if I said, are you certain that Russia? Well, no, I'm not certain, right? So do they, are they interpreting, do you think as, do you have certain confidence or very certain or very likely confidence? or better than 50-50 confidence. Well, you don't know what they mean when they hear think. And so you don't know what they're responding when they say yes or no. Right? If they have a very high evidential standard, they might say no, but it's because they say, well, because I'm not certain. And they go, well, I think there's a better than 50% chance. Then that person might say yes, but they're answering different questions. Likewise, what does the word Russia mean in the context of that question? Does it mean the Russian people? Does it mean Russian oligarchs? Does it mean the official Russian government? Many might interpret as Vladimir Putin or his operatives directly, but not all responders may make that interpretation. So it's not clear what they're responding to if they say, yes, I do think Russia interfered because we don't know what they mean by Russia. Then the next word, interfered. The word is open to interpretation and needs to be viewed in the context of the following prepositional phrase in the 2016 election. Well, how do they interpret the 2016 election? 
Do they mean the entire uh, months long election process? Or do they mean the tallying of votes at the very end of this election process, right? It's not clear which part of the election or the election process you have in mind with that reference. And that feeds into the final word, election, right? Um, we have a real ambiguity. For some, the election actually means the casting or tallying of votes, uh, or it might mean just the month long campaign. So if you, if you think that there was influence peddling during the month long campaign, that's a kind of interference, but that's not the same kind of interference as manipulating vote tallies at the very end. So whether you think the Russia interfered with the election requires you get much clearer about what you mean by interfered and what you mean by the election. So if the survey results tell us that 55% of respondents think that Russia interfered in the 2016 election, what does that really tell us? Well, nothing particularly worthwhile. And why is that? Because the question itself is ambiguous. In order to get survey questions that are actually serviceable to us, you have to try to remove as much of these kinds of ambiguities as possible. So that concludes my uh, little lecture on uh, questions and, and ambiguity. And uh, I hope this was helpful to you. Naturally, if you have, uh, well, I was gonna say, if you have questions about any of this, wanna discuss it with me further, please don't be shy about getting in touch with me. Until next time then. <laughs>